All right, good morning and welcome. Um, yes, as you might remember, I was a bit slow last week or maybe a bit over ambitious with the amount of content that I planned to cover in the lecture on model interpretation. We have some leftovers. Um, well, in fact, hardly spoke over the second part of the interpretation chapter titled Local and Example-Based Explanations. Well, I do think that this, this content is so important that it is worthwhile to take it over into this week and have a look into it. You'll also be exposed to some of the techniques in this part, the interpretation part in general, and the, the local explanation methods in particular in the tutorial today. So that makes even more sense to have a look into it. Okay, so just so that to get everybody started, I'm still in the slide deck of the ninth chapter, Machine Learning Model Interpretation. We, in the very beginning, distinguished well, some types of explanation techniques or the very meaning of the term explanation or interpretation of a model. We did cover techniques like partial dependence plots or permutation-based feature importance in some depth in the last week. So I assume this is known. And to remind you, the different family of techniques to interpret methods, that was the family of local techniques, local explanation methods, where local means that we are interested in the reason why some model predicted an individual case, an individual data instance in, the specific, in a specific way. That's meant by local. Um, we start with LIME, an acronym for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanation. There you also have this element of locality in the very name of the technique. And this will also make the setting clear, I believe. Um, so assume we are given some model, some black box model, gradient boosting machine, neural network, a random forest, whatever. We use this model to inform decision making. This means that the model generates forecasts for individual data items that we feed the model and could, to stay in our typical example, classify incoming credit applications into good risks and bad risks. The goal in local interpretation is to understand why the black box model made a certain prediction for an individual application. That's the overarching goal. And um, the, the Lyme paper of uh, Ribeiro, they proposed a specific way to implement that. You'll see shortly it's, um, you, you can look at Lyme more of a, a, a framework where the paper proposes a specific implementation of that framework. But uh, let's not look ahead too far. Uh, we have a model, and the model uh, generates predictions. I'm a bit deprived of all my nice technology these days, so I um, have to use this as a laser pointer. We have a model. Uh, we get predictions from that model. When we present it an individual piece of data, for example, the symptoms of one patient, sneeze, weight, headache, no fatigue, age, and the model predicts, oh, flu. And then comes Lyme. For if you look very carefully at this example, you see that for a reduced set of features, only sneeze, headache, and no fatigue, you get an indication whether the specific value that you observe for these attributes for this patient has caused the prediction of flu. Where here the green color means they support the prediction of the model the patient suffering from flu, and red means that, well, they actually 
disagree with the model prediction or provide evidence against flu. And this is the way Lyme explanations look like, and this is what is then presented to a human decision maker like an MD to finally make a decision. So their setting, the setting that Ribeiro et al. imagines is that there is a human decision maker that needs to diagnose a model or where a model just informs decisions but does not make decisions. And then we want to provide the human in charge of the decision some rational why the model believes in a certain prediction. I redraw that in a credit scoring setting for clarity. So this is the output of Lyme. That's what you will also see in the tutorial. And say we have a credit applicant with values for the features age, salary, credit amount, and a binary feature, collateral, yes, no, is it a, a secured loan or an unsecured loan? And then for one application, we get the output of what was the true label of this applicant, the actual class. Let's say he was a good risk. We also get the model prediction. Let's say the model produced an estimate of probability of being good 75%, fairly high probability. So if given that the actual class was good, the model did fairly well. And then for the features, um, here I use all of the above features. That is typically not the case. Typically Lyme looks only at a reduced set of features. We get these bar plots where the magnitude of the bar indicates if the feature was important or not, and where then the sign or the coloring indicates whether the value of the feature did support the prediction of the model or, well, was rather evidence against that prediction, but outweighted by the value in other features. So here our applicant, um, apparently whatever age he was, that was pretty good, so maybe 35 or something, medium age, already on the job, stable earnings, etc. Then the most important positive feature was that the loan was secured, so maybe he already owed an apartment and used that as collateral, secure the loan. That caused the model to output this high probability of this risk being, being a good one. And the payment of the applicant may also be in well. And then we see this red bar for credit amount. So possibly he applied for a relatively large loan, given the salary. That could be a way to look into this model. And um, the assumption is that a human can make sense of that and can then, well, make, find comfort in the prediction, approve the prediction have more comfort in the model in that it might agree with the domain knowledge that we have in credit risk management. However you look at it, this is the output. This is uh, the type of interpretability or explanation that Lyme provides. I believe this will become uh, very clear shortly. Essentially, these bars, what they represent essentially are um, coefficients in a linear model. So you can, can look at these values as beta coefficients, which are positive or negative, and have a certain magnitude in linear model, uh, as we shall see shortly. The, the idea of the objective is to give decision makers and indications how feature values overall cause the prediction. So it's, it's causal evidence as far as the prediction, 75% uh, of good risk is concerned. Question is then, okay, how, how do we arrive at this output? And I well, already spoiled you by saying, you know, basically there is a linear model underneath. But let's look at that in some more detail. Uh, starting with the characteristics of Lyme. Um, Lyme, local interpretable model agnostic explanation. It's a good name uh, in that if you split it out, it tells you a lot. So it's local. Well, we established already what locality means. We look at individual cases, individual data items. 
Um, and what Lyme does it, it approximates the behavior of our black box model in the vicinity of the focal stator item. So in the neighborhood of the case that we are explaining, in the neighborhood of this individual guy applying for a loan. Well, interpretability is achieved by using an interpretable model, typically either a linear model or a decision tree, a shallow decision tree, as a surrogate model. Remember last week we talked about surrogate models. You approximate the behavior of the black box using a simpler interpretable linear model. And the assumption is that this is what the picture is meant to represent. Even a complex model that fits this very complicated decision boundary that you see in blue and well reddish coloring, fairly complicated model that created this decision boundary. If we look into specific areas, if we look at this specific data instance in bold with a bold red cross, in the vicinity of that data instance that's shown by the dashed line, our very complicated model behaves linear. So that's the premise, if you wish. Even the complicated model behaves in a linear way in a small area. So as long as we focus the explanation to a certain sub-space or certain area, a local area of a data item, then a linear model should be able to approximate the black box reasonably well. Well, and model agnostic, that just means this, all we need is the prediction of the model. It can be any model. It's LIME is not tied to, to neural networks and works only for these or tied to some other type of classification model or regression model. It's totally model agnostic. I try to spell out the operations in pseudocode. This is uh, what I then came up with. First step being us selecting the data instance of interest. We then perturb our data set somehow, more on that later. We create artificial data through, through uh, perturbation. And then we call our black box model to get predictions for these new artificial perturbed data instances. We weight these new artificial data instances according to their proximity to our focal data item that we try to explain, or the prediction of which we try to explain. And then we train our interpretable, our white box model, on the artificial data using the labels from our black box model. And whatever comes out of that, we present as our interpretation. That's our result. And if the white box model happens to be a linear model, then this plot I was showing earlier, this line output with the bars, it makes sense how these could represent coefficient values. That's the overall framework. That's fairly general. And then packages and the paper will provide a concrete implementation of this concept. I think it's not immediately clear why we need all these steps, like why don't we perturb the data, um, but this will become clearer in the reminder. So, and I also don't see any pressing questions right now, so let's continue a little bit. When saying Lime actually is a framework, let's elaborate a bit on that. Why is that a framework? And some formality helps with, with seeing that, I believe. We need to make sense of this, this formula here. It's from the paper, by the way. We have one data item, xi. x is a vector, as usual, it's bold x, i for an individual data item and that we explain. 
explanation of xi. That's the Lyme output. So let's look at the right hand side. That's more interesting. We see there. Um, first of all, we have two functionals or models, f hat and g. If you think about it, a model is actually a, a, a yeah, a model is a function. Take logistic regression as an example. That's a model. We have our logistic regression model. I'm using that wording over and over again. But what that actually is, or also is, it's, it's just a functional, right? We have estimated the parameters, the betas. This is why we have a model. That's our regression formula. And we can put data items to this formula. So f hat is our model, our model function. And then g is the corresponding function of the surrogate model, for example, a linear model. Pi is our proximity measure. So pi xi captures the neighborhood of xi somehow. And then, um, well, L is some sort of, of loss function. And um, that is called a local fidelity measure. Fidelity is a term I used last week. I used fidelity when um, describing the error of a surrogate model, the error of a model that tries to predict the forecasts of a block box model. That was the meaning of fidelity. Same here. The, the loss that we measure is the loss between our black box model prediction coming from f hat and for the data item xi and the forecasts or the output of our interpretation model, G. G will also produce an output for Xi, but it will differ from the black box model output and the disagreement between these two quantities. This loss is what we measure, and because it's not the disagreement between a forecast and the actual, we don't really call it a loss, but a fidelity measure. And due to pi, it's a local fidelity measure because we only look at the loss, or we emphasize the, the loss in the neighborhood of Xi. And in order to ensure that our interpretation model actually is interpretable, we constrain the complexity of G. And that's the last term. The last term can be thought of as a, a penalty term, like a rich penalty or a Lasso penalty, where more complicated models receive a, a higher value and are thus punished because we want to minimize this quantity. And well, so, so this is what I meant by, by framework. We have the freedom to choose the proximity measure and can configure that. We have the freedom to choose what G is. And we have freedom in the choice of our complexity penalty. And hence, we could, in theory, implement this approach toward getting an explanation for a data in instance in many ways. In practice, proximity is difficult and depends on the type of data. Lime chooses complexity a priori by making you input the number of features to consider. If you have a credit scorecard with, let's say, 25 variables, and you want to explain an individual decision, you need to input how many of the 25 variables you want to see in your explanation. So this choice is, is, is delegated to the user, and complexity is measured in terms of the number of features. The more features you use, the more accurate will be your approximation, uh, the better this local fidelity measure. But at the same time, the more features you see in your Lime output, the more difficult it will be to make sense of that.
think about this plot with many more rows, many more features. It will become even harder to make sense of, okay, what is it that the model was doing? And this is why the authors of Lyme said, let's constrain this. Let's say human decision makers can only digest a certain number of features, a certain amount of information. So let's constrain the number of features that we use as part of Lyme. Lyme will then select the features, the best ones, but it will only select for the interpretation model that many features. This is how the complexity term is dealt with. And as far as the interpretation method G goes, standard implementations of Lyme will allow you to choose either decision trees or linear models. And uh, typically, what we use is lasso. That's the standard interpretation model in Lyme. Because with lasso, it's fairly easy. On the one hand, it's fairly easy to build a model with exactly k, let's say, features. Lasso is quick, so you can run it multiple times. You first run it with a very large uh, value or parameter of the complexity penalty, so very, very strong penalization, very strong regularization. This means that your model will probably use only zero or one features, and then you lower the, the, the regularization penalty till one feature enters the model, two, three, and you stop this exercise of incrementally lowering the penalty as soon as you have exactly k features in your model. With trees, that would work as well. But then we, with trees, the interpretation, the, the output um, cannot as easily be presented by these nice bar plots with coloring for the sign, etc. So lasso is the interpretation model of choice. A nice feature, I won't elaborate on that, but a nice feature of Lime is that it works with any data. So in fact, it's not typically used together with tabular data. Prevailing applications are with image data or text data also. And that's pretty cool. And this is why it's, it's, it's a framework. The way you implement the perturbation step depends on your type of data. For images, for example, you define what they call superpixels, areas of an image, and then you switch these on and off to create perturbed instances of an image that you then predict. And what you then get later on is an, an explanation method that tells you which parts of the image were relevant for your image classification model and cause the model to predict, for example, that this shows a frog. Or with text data, you perturb your data by switching on and off individual words and then receive as output the individual words that caused your model to predict or to classify text in a certain way. Imagine a sentiment model that um, predicts tweets into tweets into those that have that carry a positive polarity and those that carry a negative polarity. Sentiment analysis on tweets. Lime would deliver you the words that made the model believe that a certain tweet is positive. That's fairly nice that you can not only interpret arbitrary black box models, but also, maybe not arbitrary, but different types of data, tabular, text, and images. Makes this a very universal tool. Um, this graph comes from the, the ebook that I use as foundation for the chapter to illustrate Lyme on tabular data. Uh, let's go through these steps. So for tabular data, in two dimensions with two features, x1 and x2, 
we would um, perturb our data in such a way that we take each feature, find its mean, find its standard deviation, and then randomly sample from a normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation. And that's basically shown here. Um, the, the coloring in the left panel depicts the behavior of some black box models, and obviously this is complicated, or at least nonlinear. The black dots in the right panel depict the random data that we sample from a normal distribution. The yellow dot is the data instance that we try to interpret. We next weight our data, and here Lime uses an exponential kernel estimator to do the weighting, how close a artificial data point, a black dot, is to the yellow one, our focal data item that we try to explain. And then you see that we weight data points. For tabular data, it's, well, this, this notion of we look only into the neighborhood is implemented by our weighting. So we don't look into the neighborhood only. We consider all the artificial data points, but we weight these according to their proximity. That was a decision by uh, Ribeiro et al., by the authors of the packet, to do it in this way. It's not the only possible way. Remember, Lime is a framework. But if we stick to standard implementations and don't want to implement it on our own, that's how it works. Then we fit our explanation model to the black dots and their weights. So we want to use a model that is able to process data point weights. Conveniently, trees and also lasso are able to do that. For lasso, we use something like a weighted, regularized likelihood function and maximize this. And then you have the white line here, which is the linear explanation model. And to explain the yellow dot, we look at beta 1 and beta 2 of that linear model. That's Lyme in a nutshell. And how it works for tabular data. Again, you'll see we've worked also in the tutorial, I understood, but nonetheless. Software support, pretty good. Uh, Python, you have it available in at least one package. Um, the prediction model and the surrogate model, the local model, are independent, not tied together. That's convenient. So you could also update them um, in isolation. That might be useful in operation. Credit scoring, you might update your scorecard every now and then. That does not mean that you use entirely different features. So you could still use the explanation model that you have in place and vice versa. Might be useful. In fact, you could, in theory, use different features for the explanation model than you use for the black box model. The explanation model is just a local approximation of your black box. There is no strong need to use the same features. You could use more interpretable features, in theory. Should you know a little bit about text analytics, um, then to give you an idea, in, in text data, the black box model will typically use embeddings these days, text embeddings, whereas Lime will typically be based on a back of word model. If that does not make sense to you whatsoever, no problem, uh, not the scope of this course, um, but in case you've worked with text data before, this might make sense to you. So, in fact, different features are used as part of Lime whenever we interpret text data. We could also make use of, of that feature with tabular data. And the explanations they are fairly concise, sort of human friendly. I mean, this is judgment. Um, you might agree or disagree with that. Um, that's textbook judgment, let's say. But given that it is this approximation, um, it's probably not sufficient for compliance settings like credit risk, although I've been using that example, 
today it would be it's an it's an open debate whether interpretation techniques like this one would facilitate the use of black box models in credit decisioning given for example gdpr legislation whether something like lime is enough to explain your credit decision to customers um, it's, it's under debate probably not for example an issue is that uh, the explanation that we provide might still be too complicated for a layman, somebody applying for credit knowing nothing about statistics. For us, it's okay. We know how linear models work. We know what a coefficient in a linear model is. And then we can make sense of these bar plots and appreciate how, given the bar plots, a probability of 75% emerges. Layman might not be able to, to make this reasoning. And then your explanation would not really be and understandable, which might violate regulatory requirements. But it's, 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 it's undecided yet. Right, um, so Lime. Um, there were the positive parts, negative parts, maybe it's all a little bit ad hoc. In most settings, it's used as built, as crafted coded in these implementation in these packages and they for example set a different uh, set a, a specific uh, bandwidth for the smoothing kernel to calculate the proximity and you can show when you adjust this value the bandwidth of your kernel function your explanation change i know of one simulation study cited here alvarez millis at our recent one where they looked specifically into that how do the explanations of Lime change when um, well, we change parameters in Lime or, or also in the face of feature correlation, which is also an issue in the perturbation step. And they do find, observe that the variation, the results that you get from Lime vary a lot uh, across different random perturbations of your data, across bandwidth, etc. So there is more work to be done. The framework has potential. That's maybe the overall conclusion. It has a lot of potential, this framework, but there is more work to be done. Uh, for example, dealing with this ambiguity because of the random permutation. OK, that was line. Stop here. Um, just to throw some more buzzwords at you, uh, many other exciting things out there, and I uh, recommend the ebook I'm citing over and over again, a starting point. It's super useful, super easy read, and very comprehensive, very broad in the techniques that it touches upon. Um, another very hot thing these days are SHAP values. That's just that you heard about them, SHAP values. They come from game theory, the Shapley value from game theory. If you have done game theory, uh, you know this concept. The Shapley value is something like a fair payoff that the players in a coalition that play together receive. And drawing upon this, this theory, that's Nobel Prize winning theory, um, people came up, or well, people, Lundberg and Lee came up with the way to, well, say, okay, all the attributes in a predictive model form a coalition, and the values for the attributes each contribute toward the prediction of the model, let's work out the fair reward of a feature value. There are packages to implement this concept. Uh, the output looks quite nice, I believe. Uh, I'll briefly comment on the output shortly. You, you see it here. Um, it's, as I said, very hot these days. It's highly demanding computationally. Uh, strong combinatorics at work here. So using that on a reasonably sized data set is a pain. That's the main obstacle. Otherwise, you get very powerful local explanations with SHAP values. And uh, also, you can nicely aggregate these local explanations to get global explanations. So the packages for SHAP, they provide you functionality for both. 
local and global explanations, very useful. And the main disadvantage is the computational um, effort that's needed to do the, do the calculations. So well, the output is not entirely dissimilar from Lime. This example here, I, I took it from the blog as usual with, with me. Uh, here we talk about football players, soccer players, football. So I'm talking about soccer, not American football, although it's currently the NFL season, but this is ordinary football. And um, you see some model prediction, 0.7. That's the prediction of a model for an individual player where how likely it is that he receives the award player of the match. That was the use case here. And then for individual features in that data, you see the features down here. We get, well, their Shapley value, their contribution, whether it was positive or negative, and how large it was. So, for example, um, our player, our focal player, was predicted to be to have a 70% chance of getting this award, player of the match, so apparently he did reasonably well. And our SHAP values provide us some insight why our model believes that he has such high probability. Um, there was a feature, goal scored. How many goals did the player score? And the value of that feature was 2. So apparently our player scored 2 goals in a match, which is fairly good. So that should boost his probability to become player of the match. And indeed, these axes here, I, well, it's very hard for you to interpret the number in the projection, but maybe you have a printout available or even better, uh, a, a laptop or tablet. We see that the forecast was 70%. And here, very hard, you see a value of 0.5979, so 60%. You can read that as had our player not scored these two goals, his chance of becoming player of the match would drop to 60%. So by 10%. This 10% boost in the prediction he received because of scoring two goals. And on the other hand, and this was the most important attribute among the, let's say, positive attributes that contributed that made it more likely to become player of the match. He also had seven so shots on target, which was apparently pretty good, and increased his probability. He kicked six corners, which also increased his probability. He committed 25 fouls, so he was rough. That was positive, apparently, picked up by the model. Him being very active, um, committing some fouls, but apparently that was positive to become player of the match and also contributed. And these bar width, they always give you the amount of probability that can be attributed to this specific feature value. And that is really nice as an explanation, right? That's much better than line, if you think about it. There you had the big bar, okay, that was important. And the other bar was half of that, okay, half the value of the beater. That's even better. So the, the case was which team um, has the player of the match among them. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense. This morning I was reasoning, okay, 148, that K was not the distance covered by one player, but for a team it makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was slightly wrong here. Um, it's not the, play, uh, the, the per player values, it's the per team values, but in terms of how to process this output, it does not make a big difference. The really nice thing here, again, is that you have a probability and you can decompose this probability into attribute values. Some that contribute, drive up the probability, and some that make a negative contribution and drive down the probability. Like ball possession, 38%. So our team had only 38% ball possession. The other team has much higher ball possessions. Um, that was sort of had our team higher value for ball positioning than the probability of 
having the player of the match among them would rise even further. Right? So very useful, but costly. It's somewhat similar to Lime in terms of what it, what it delivers. Better, but at a higher price. Maybe this is the overall park away. And then now um, some yet other techniques that are recently proposed that work on the basis of example. Here, it's, 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 it's yet different from Lime and, and Shep. Here the output is a data item. We present a decision maker a data item. It might be a real one, or typically it's an artificial one. And use this data item to get some insight how a model behaves. Um, and there are some flavors. Anchors, for example. Anchors come from the same authors that also invented Lime. An anchor is a rule, a simple decision rule using a subset of the features, finding the relevant subset and threshold values, and it anchors the prediction in that any change that you apply to the other features not part of your rule would not change the prediction. So you get a rule why a model believes that one applicant is a bad credit risk. And this rule might use the features bureau score, age, and income. And then any change in some other features that your scorecard might use, um, number of months previously delinquent, or number of relatives, number of kids, wh whatever other features the model uses, the black box model might use, you could change them in any way without your decision of this applicant being, say, bad risk, changes. So it's like a minimal description of a rule that is stable. Yeah, that provides some insight. It's useful to know. A bit hard to tell, I feel, how, what this is really good for, but it's clearly useful to know. We would need to look much deeper into decision processes in, in, in banking or generally real world decision processes to appreciate how useful that is. Or um, there are also counterfactual examples where um, it's, it's related. Here we look for the smallest change of feature values. So how could we um, how could we 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 flip the prediction of a model? A model predicts that an applicant is a bad risk. Let's say we want to consult this applicant. Sorry, we can't give you credit. Our model says no. Uh, and the applicant says, oh, God, I need this money. What can I do? And well, let, let's discuss what you could do. Look, um, apparently your bureau score is too low. That could come out of a counterfactual example. A minimum change in some variable, let's say the bureau score, might flip the prediction of the model. In counterfactual examples, encompass a family of algorithms to identify such minimal changes to flip the prediction. And that is then closely related to these adversarial examples, also very useful, um, which are examples that aim at deciding a model. So what's the minimum change to a feature for a model to make an error? It's closely related, slightly different. Here we look into any correct classification of a model. There was a good applicant. The model categorized the applicant as good risks. What would be a minimum change to the feature value so that the model gets this wrong and incorrectly classifies our good risk as a bad risk? Um, that, for example, has many applications in autonomous driving where you definitely want to know what would be the minimum change of a traffic sign, for example, of the image of a traffic sign to make a model to fail recognize this traffic sign, the stop sign, for instance. It's obviously crucially important that traffic signs are recognized in the correct way. And then you can ask, okay, how robust is my model? 
what would be the minimum change to the representation of the sign, the image representation, so that it's no longer recognized as a stop sign. Again, highly useful. Um, well, my aim here is that you get a vague feeling, some feeling for the gist of these example based explanation techniques. We haven't looked into any of them. Uh, how they work, if you're interested, have a look into the blog. It's very current stuff, very um, recent uh, research. So, also really interesting for follow up studies if you wish. And with that, I just want to conclude the interpretation chapters. Um, at least until the tutorial starts. And move on with something else. Provided. That are, oh, well, but certainly there is always time for, for questions, comments, or anything. Okay, but. Does not seem to be the case. Fair enough. Um, so, well, as usual, summary slides just provide some well, summary that I came up with. Uh, normally, I don't have time to look into that. I won't look into that today. But just note that these summary summary slides exist in the slide books, and they should also be useful for um, when you well for your exam preparation. I really try and invest quite some time into these slides to come up with the things that I believe are. Uh, particularly important of a paper chapter. So pay some attention to that, please. Um, all right. I know that saying this is important and then not looking at it is a bit odd, but we just discussed the chapter and um, it's probably too early to appreciate my summary. Let's rather uh, move on. I need to admit that I am a little bit behind my schedule uh, and will make some shortening in the remaining uh, sessions. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that many more sessions. Um, always amazing how quick time goes. This part here looks into some specific challenges that we typically encounter in practice. When we build predictive models, especially classification models, and um, these challenges, class imbalance and cost sensitivity, are particularly characteristic, I believe, for applications in business. So this chapter brings us on a path toward looking into more depth into the application of machine learning in real-world business settings. Well, introduction, that's the agenda, and then the two parts will be treated rather individually. There are similarities between the two families in balanced learning and cost-sensitive learning. The strategies to tackle these challenges also share similarity. And therefore, I'll, I'll make use of that to only explain some techniques to tackle imbalance and then refer to other cost sensitive techniques to tackle imbalance in different ways. But first of all, let's become clear of the problem. So, chapter with two main blocks that's the take home here. The example setting that I've been using over and over again was credit risk because I'm interested in the field and work in that field. I also had some examples from marketing, like predicting whether customers are about to quit, cancel a subscription in app marketing, for example. Very important uh, use case, very high churn rates. And if we proactively know that the customer is about to quit, through subscription, maybe we can do something about it. Occasionally, I talk about fraud modeling as well, and there are other use cases. Predictive maintenance is one that very rarely came up. If we try to identify some common denominators in these use cases, then we can say binary classification is something that is often useful to tackle these tasks. Credit scoring, we can use binary classification to quantify the probability of 
an applicant being a bad risk or the probability of an subscriber canceling her subscription. That's also a binary classification problem. If you want to predict whether somebody is going to purchase an item in response to an email or some other incentive, a coupon maybe, that's response modeling. Again, the two states of interests are purchase, no purchase, binary or in fraud equally transaction is legitimate or fraudulent. So again, binary classification is a useful framework. Another commonality in each of these settings, we have one class that is of particular interest. And then we have the other class, right? In credit risk, our key interest is to identify those that will not pay back. So these are the ones we must not lend to. And we would expect these people to represent a minority. In schön modeling, here maybe app marketing is a bad example, uh, generally would assume that we have more customers who are loyal than we have customers who are about to quit. Otherwise, machine learning is not our key business problem, right? So churners typically represent a minority in, among the customer base or in a data set. Unfortunately, equally so, in marketing campaigns where we try to stimulate purchases, we typically contact a much larger number of customers than actually make the purchase. So the response rate to certain types of campaigns often is rather, rather small. And, well, hopefully, the number of fraudulent transactions will outnumber the legitimate transaction for any credit card company. So the important class that we focus our attention on typically the minority. And also, getting this important class wrong is typically associated with higher errors. It's more costly to misclassify a bad risk as a good risk because then we lend money and don't get it back than it is to classify a good risk as a bad risk because then we don't lend money and lose the interest that we would have earned otherwise. But that's better than facing the actual loss. The relevant class represents often a minority, and getting the relevant class wrong is often associated with higher error. We see that in many problems, not all, but many. And, well, imbalanced learning and cost sensitive learning are the streams in the machine learning literature that look specifically into these issues. How to attack or approach problems where one class is heavily outnumbered by the other class, imbalanced learning, or what to do if the costs of classification errors are not symmetric. Try to define that on this slide here. The vast majority of literature looks into classification problems. There are similar problems in regression. Although imbalance classes, class imbalance, one class outnumbering the other, that's not strictly defined if you don't have classes. So in regression, you, have my, you might see something like skewed, non-normal distribution. And they are sort of equivalent. But I will focus very much on classification in this chapter. All right. Um, Speaking about the asymmetric costs of error, well, I'm deprived of my pen, so I can't write on the slide, hence it does not make so much sense. The aim here was to reason a little bit, brainstorm a little bit with you, what the different costs of error are in, in fraud discovery, direct marketing, and churn modeling. Well, I already gave the answer for credit scoring. Um, maybe as one little test, say uh, you are a churn modeler. What are the error costs 
that come into play in certain modeling. How would you describe the error costs when predicting whether a customer is going to quit? We predict <coughs> an actual churner as somebody who is going to stay. One error. The other error, we predict somebody who's actually staying and loyal as a churner. We have somebody who's loyal, we predict her to be a churner. What is the cost associated with that? Or could be? There is no clear cut answer. What could be the cost associated with that? Yeah, exactly. And I think this is also what, what you said. You, you spent marketing effort trying to persuade her to stay, but she never had an intention to leave. That's wasted. Uh, and the other error? We miss an actual churner? What is then the cost? The lost profit, and I think this is the uh, most intuitive way to look at it. Uh, a, a customer who has a business relationship, a healthy business relationship with us, generates a stream of revenue or, or profit. And drawing a little bit on your marketing background, we could say, so if the customer is leaving, we lose the customer lifetime value. If you have the LV estimation, customer lifetime estimation set up in your marketing department, you will be able to tell what's the CLV of a customer. And if the customer turns, that is what you lose. If you have an app that generates all that, well, brings in a subscription fee of, of 8 euros, or let's say 12 euros a month. Prime Music, 12 euros a month. That is the monthly revenue. There are no additional revenues, at least no tangible additional revenues, maybe positive word of mouth, but let's not make it too complicated. That's the revenue we get every month. We can discount that over the length of the customer relationship. That's the COV of the customer in Prime Music. If I if somebody who might have this service subscribed quits a uh, subscription, we lose this CLV, and that is the cost. That was a simplification. I made another one, a uh, more subtle one, but more on that in the subsequent session on marketing decision model. Things are a bit more complicated but in practice, but we could look at it from that way. If there is a churner, we will lose the CLV. So a model that is trying to predict churners and fails to predict an actual churner brings in a cost which is sort of, let's say, proportional to the CLV of the customer. So again, we have two types of cost, wasted marketing effort as opposed to lost CLV, and there is little reason to believe that these costs are equivalent. They are not in virtually any real-world setting, so they are asymmetric. We can make a similar narrative for response modeling, direct marketing, and for fraud discovery. Maybe try to do that as your homework. Now, um, this is a chart of the predictive modeling process. We've seen that earlier on with the individual stages, data prep, model development, evaluation, and both of these phenomena, asymmetric costs and imbalance, we can tackle at multiple steps. That's the data step. We can massage our data to, well, let's, let's say, <clears throat> if we ignore class imbalance and if we ignore cost sensitivity, that will adversely affect our models. It's not good. We shouldn't. Um, so we could do something about these phenomena, imbalance and cost sensitivity, either in the data preparation stage, using resampling strategies, more on that later. We can manipulate our algorithms, trying to make them aware of error costs, for example. And also we can and need to revise our practices to evaluate models, so as to take imbalance or cost sensitivity into account. Data prep, model development, and evaluation are the key attention points. And for each of these attention points, there are different strategies out there. Um, first of all, some intuition, um, what we talk about. 
You see two scenarios here, A and B. One is a very simplified one, that's a textbook example, and one that's maybe a little more representative of what's going on in the real world. Starting with the simplified scenario, um, two classes, and we see how the red class is heavily outnumbered by the green one. And then maybe we have some noise examples as well. And the more representative picture on the right hand side highlights the fact that typically it's not so easy that we have not one area where all the examples of one class live in. The red ones all nicely encapsulated in the center of our space, surrounded by the green ones. Real world data is not as nice. A powerful model would have an easy go with that kind of data. Uh, normally, we have different sub areas or subspaces. One might be more populated by the red class, the other more populated by the green class. Overall, there might be some imbalance, and that's shown on the left hand side. Um, so, um, let's start with things that we can do to address class imbalance at the evaluation step. Evaluation step is also informative why imbalance is a problem. First of all, we need to understand why imbalance is a problem. Um, and why we need to take care that whenever we evaluate model, we consider the distribution of the two classes. Um, here's just the confusion table again that we often use in binary classification and from on, on which many popular evaluation methods are based on, like error rate, specificity, sensitivity, etc. Here's a hypothetical classifier classifying 100 data instances. And based on the confusion table, we can establish that our classifier achieved a classification accuracy, or PCC, percentage correctly classified of 100% and an error rate of 0%. So it's a super powerful classifier. Perfect. And we can change the example a little bit, like this. And recomputing our evaluation methods, we observe the classification accuracy drops to 98%, or equivalently, the error rate ra raises to 2%. And if 100% is perfect, then 89% is still pretty good, right? There's no positive predicted. Although the error rate is low, Indeed, we, we, we call that, no positive predicted, so we call that a naive classifier. It's naive in that it always classifies one class, only one class. I don't need a model for that. If the prediction is always uh, negative, I don't need a model to do that. I can lend money to every credit applicant that visits me. Then I don't need a scorecard. The very point is to distinguish the two classes. So. Take home here, error rate can be extremely misleading when there is imbalance. When there is imbalance, a naive model that always predicts the majority class scores very high on accuracy and error rate. Um, here are some of the typical alternative threshold measures, so measures based on the confusion table that are more robust. The geometric mean of sensitivity and specificity is sometimes used, the G measure, or the F measure is very popular, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And you can, in theory, parameterize the, the F measure. I'm showing you the general formula here with 1 plus theta square times recall times precision over recall plus precision, um, unless otherwise specified, beta is set to 1, so the F1 measure. Sometimes you read F measure, 
with nothing else, and then you know it's F1. Sometimes people explicitly say F1 measure. There is some variation here. These measures are robust. If you recalculate these measures for our naive classifier, you see that the G-mean is zero, uh, and the F measure is not even defined. So these measures are robust and help you to assess models in the face of class imbalance. If there is imbalance, don't use accuracy, don't use error. If there is misleading, use F or G. Or use something like drug analysis, which also is robust toward class imbalance. You can also use precision and recall curves. Some material on these are available in the handout. Graphical measures are designed to be also, amongst others, robust towards imbalance. There are some interesting newer versions, cost curves, dryer curves proposed in the literature. If that is something that interests you, have a look. It's not relevant for the course. And there is research on them. So, um, to sum up, when we assess models and the data is imbalanced, we have to be careful. That standard measures can give misleading advice. That was the main take home here. And the thing is, it's actually a bit worse than that. The reason we went through this example is that when there is imbalance in your data, it not only impacts the evaluation, similar reasoning also applies when models are built. The criteria underneath model estimation, information gain, likelihood, are also based on a comparison of actuals and predictions. And if most actuals belong to one class, a naive classifier also displays a high likelihood. Naive classifier setting all beaters to zero, the likelihood will look pretty good if there is imbalance. And that's the, the real pro problem, which I was trying to give you a feeling for, starting with the confusion table. When there is imbalance, a naive model looks pretty good. Also, in the optimization that underlines model building or model estimation. Model estimation is always done by some sort of optimization. Maximum likelihood, maximizing information gain, maximizing other more exotic loss functions. Uh, sorry optimizing other more exotic loss functions in other algorithms, it's always sort of optimization, and this optimization becomes tricky if there are only very few examples from one class, because naive models always look pretty good. The fit calculation in model estimation overemphasizes majority class example. That's a way to look at the problem. And this biases model estimation toward naive models. Trees are very vulnerable to that, for example. Many pruning criteria that are, by default, active when building a tree would say, ah, don't grow your tree any further. The contribution of the split is not big enough. That's a problem coming from the imbalance. And then you might, if you naively apply a tree growing algorithm to an imbalanced data set, you might observe that the algorithm does not perform any split. It just returns the root node with all the data. Refusing to split the data because due to the imbalance, there is no split that you could take that would provide a substantial increase in the information gain. Okay, you can address that by manipulating your metaparameters of the tree, but it's all a bit more complicated. And thus, we see algorithmic up, uh, adaptations, newer algorithms, algorithms specifically designed for independent problems. I won't look at them in depth. In a nutshell, these algorithms typically come from the field of cost-sensitive learning. You just pretend that the cost of misclassifying a minority case is higher than the cost of misclassifying a majority case 
and then algorithms for cost sensitive learning can be used to approach imbalance. It's as simple as that. Just one idea uh, for a very simple algorithm that you can easily code yourself that is sort of robust toward imbalance. Um, it has been proposed in the literature multiple times under different names. I'm referring to a paper by Paleo Logo et al. It's not the only paper um, that invents this method. They propose a bagging classifier. You see the bootstrap samples here. And they say just, well, you know, <clears throat> in bagging we have the bootstrap sampling. Let's manipulate the bootstrap sampling a little bit. Let's say um, we sample with replacement, yes, but um, let's say in each bootstrap sample we take all the positive instances or the minority instances. You see that in all n bootstrap samples I have a, b, and c, the minority class, fully covered. And from the majority class, labeled alphanumerically, uh, sorry, labeled numerically, I just take a subset, which I pick randomly, with or without replacement. And then in every bootstrap sample, the class distribution is more even. And then, as done in bagging, I build a model from each of these bags. This model will get to see a more even class distribution. And I believe that this model will do better in recognizing the minority class. There are many different flavors of this, this idea. It's something I could do, and then what I obtain is a, it's a modified bagging algorithm. That's, well, empirically shown to be a bit, bit more immune, immune to the effect of imbalance. And then does better in imbalance problems than vanilla bagging. Um, more commonly, however, people, well, more commonly than changing the algorithms, if you change an algorithm, whatever you do works with this algorithm, but not another one. That's the downside. The majority of literature in imbalanced learning, therefore, looks at the data preparation step, because if you can cure the problem at the data level, you can use any algorithm afterwards. So this is a bit more, this approach is a bit more generic. It works in a model agnostic way, if you wish, as opposed to adjusting an individual learning algorithm. And similar to what I just showed in the scope of two bagging, these ways, they are called resampling strategies, um, in the very simplest case, they come down to just randomly deleting majority class instances, that's undersampling, or randomly copy pasting minor, minority class instances, that is called oversampling. I'm trying to visually give you an idea here on the slide. There is no consensus which one is better. Sometimes oversampling is better, sometimes undersampling is better. I'm trying to identify some pros and cons here. Uh, undersampling by deleting data, training set size decreases, so it's quicker, nice, but by deleting data you might discard useful information. Oversampling, you will observe higher training times because you duplicate data. On the other hand, you lose no information. And yet, uh, that's maybe noteworthy. Make sure you carefully look at this picture which I created using so much effort and deeply converted, investing so much effort. If you duplicate a data instance, it's, it sits just on top of the original data instance in the attribute space. So note this pattern in the oversample data set. The if oversampling, taking a minority class example, copy pasting it, the new example will sit exactly on top of the original one. depending on what algorithm you apply to this data, that might not help the algorithm much. 
um, so there are more informed ways to do that. Um, for example, there is informed undersampling, which encompasses strategies to delete majority class examples, not randomly, but delete those that you can afford deleting. For example, examples that are far away, cases that are far away from where you believe the class boundary to be. Deleting these should not be so difficult or so problematic. And then you can maybe run some approximation using new neighbor based uh, techniques. Um, this handout contains some material that illustrates algorithms under that family. Uh, given time, I want to focus on the more popular stuff. And uh, this brings me to the most popular, the workhorse in imbalanced learning, which is Smoothie. That's like the logistic regression of imbalanced learning, if you wish. Uh, came out in 2002, so it's not really recent to be honest, but still it's it's this sort of, of, of benchmark. If, if you, in your, let's say in your master dissertation, you develop a new technique for imbalanced learning, that's one of the things you must compare to, otherwise you'll see this is no good whatsoever. Or your paper will be rejected immediately. So let's look at Smoothie. Um, Smoothie stands for synthetic minority class oversampling. So it's oversampling, but it's synthetic. It's oversampling, but you try to do better than randomly or than naively duplicating data items. Instead, uh, what you do is um, you take one minority class example, denoted as Xi here. Let's say Xi comes from the minority group. You then pick k nearest neighbors from the same class, also coming from the minority class. And then you sort of average over xi and one randomly chosen instance among the nearest neighbor. The formula you see there for x nu is essentially a weighted averaging, where you randomize the weights using this delta, which you randomly draw from a standard normal. I think it makes more sense to look at this visually. Um, it's a bit tiny, but all right, it works. So here is xi. We first randomly pick a minority example. Done. That's xi. Let's say we then pick three nearest neighbors. Three is the parameter. Um, let's say we pick the highlighted instances. Out of the three nearest, out of the three nearest neighbor, we choose one. I denote it by x hat j. That's the randomly chosen neighbor out of the three nearest neighbors of x i. And then this formula for x mu corresponds to us creating a new artificial data point on the line, somewhere on the line. Connecting xi and x hat j. X new is artificial. This data point was never observed. But by construction, we know it's sort of near the original minority case xi and a neighboring case x hat j. So it's somewhat in the area, in the area where minority cases occur. In our attribute space, and still it's not right on top of the original data point as in naive oversampling. And then you can repeat that as many times as you wish. Every iteration will contribute you one new artificial data point, and by repeating the whole exercise over and over, you can eventually arrive at a, a class distribution, majority to minority that you deem appropriate. So the simplest way would be to say, I do that as often as it takes me to create as many minority cases as there are positive, as there are majority cases. So I repeat Smoothie as long 
until the two classes are exactly even, half half, in the data, also counting all the artificial instances, of course. Uh, typically, that is not needed. Most classifiers are okay with a imbalance ratio from, let's say, 80% to 20%. That is definitely okay. If I get a data set and the minority class still covers 20% of the data or accounts for 20% of the data, I wouldn't bother, to be honest. If it's 9 to 10, I start thinking about it. If it's 9 to 9 to 1, I probably want to try out whether something like Smoothie gives me an improvement, improves my model. Note, however, that the relative imbalance, 99% to 1%, is maybe not the most important aspect. It's more the absolute imbalance that matters. Well, recently I was criticized for that opinion by a reviewer. I still believe I'm right and the reviewer is wrong. Because if you think about it, if you have a data set with a million data instances, a million points you've got, and 1% of that comes from the minority class, 1% sounds very little. But the data set is so large. You still have many items of the minority class to learn from. You might not need Smoti. You definitely have to take action when there is a data set with absolute imbalance. Like in fraud screening, sometimes we get data sets where there are 20 fraud examples and 10 million legitimate transactions. The 10 millions don't help me much. I have only these very few fraud cases. And I mean, that makes sense because knowing for sure that something was fraudulent, it's not so easy to tell. Um, in insurance claims, when do you know for sure that the car accident was fake? Typically, what companies do is they rely on court judgment when there was a trial. You see how it's difficult to then get reliable labels. If we believe that court judgment is reliable, probably we can. But yeah, so absolute imbalance is something that's really delicate, and you can address it with techniques like Smoothie. Um, but then Smoothie has some issues, um, and we can think of, well, Smoothie 2002, what can we do better? How can we improve upon that? If in principle, this random oversampling through creating synthetic instances makes sense, can we do better? Yes, we can. We can, for example, um, not pick the minority instance randomly. If we do that as in the original smoothie, it might be the case, look at this data to get an idea, look at this point here, data point B. It belongs to the minority group, the red ones, but it's, it's right in the midst of all the green guys. The data point B looks very much as an outlier. If we randomly pick our minority instance in Smoothie and we end up with point D, that's no good. Probably it's an outlier. And the nearest neighbors to this point, well, there is, there is no, no neighbor of the right class. So the nearest neighbor is maybe that point and that point. And let's say we create a synthetic instance on the line connecting point B and this point. In, in, in this part of the space, there, there is no red point whatsoever. So we would create synthetic examples where we clearly don't want to create them. So we should pick the minority instance around which we create synthetic examples in a slightly more informed way. way. Borderline Smoothie does that. Um, and then there is a smoothie with Tomek links that also does that. I'm running out of time, and it's not so dramatically important. You could look at this example. It's, it's something like smoothie plus plus. Smoothie with some, some extra element or some extra post-processing, these Tomek links that are post-processing the smoothie algorithms. Here's a picture. 
uh, to clean up your data set um, where you try to make Smoothie better, but it's still the same, same philosophy. That's something I'd like you to take home. Resampling strategies to cure oversampling. Smoothie, you must understand. We also look at Smoothie in the tutorial. And the other important take home from this part is that, um, well, it's, it's why imbalance is bad. How it corrupts evaluation measures. And because of that, how it also impedes model estimation. And this is why we need something like Smoothie. And with that, we can continue from next week onwards with the cost sensitive learning part. And then, cost sensitive is also very managerial. It will be always more and more and more business oriented. So, um, anyways, thank you and enjoy the tutorial. <laughs>